Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today I have as my guest Dr. Ty Tyondon. Dr. Tyondon finished his medical school training at the University of California, San Francisco. From there, he completed a neurosurgical residency at Yale. He completed a complex, minimally invasive spine fellowship at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles. Today, Dr. Tyondon is the director of the Neurosurgical Spine Center at University of California, Irvine. Good morning, Dr. Tyndon. Good morning, Randy. Thanks for having me. Dr. Tyndon, what I'd like to discuss over the next 30 minutes or so is um, a, a relatively new advance in lumbar spine surgery or, or surgery on the low back, and that's the rise of minimally invasive lumbar surgery. And I understand that that, um, that is one of your specialties is, is doing minimally invasive uh, surgery of the lumbar spine. So I guess start out by telling us what is minimally invasive surgery? Yeah, that's actually a very good question. I think um, there's a misconception that minimally invasive surgery involves surgery that's uh, through the smallest incision. Sometimes that's true. I think some of the technology makes it um, um, uh, amiable towards small incisions. But essentially what minimally invasive surgery is, surgery that preserves the normal anatomy uh, while you uh, while you undergo the surgery. So you're not disrupt you're minimally uh, minimally disrupting the muscles, you're preserving some of the normal uh, anatomy um, as you uh, go about doing uh, what you need to do. Uh, it's uh, beneficial uh, for patients um, because uh, uh, obviously because you're not disrupting uh, the normal anatomy, they tend to do better, they recover faster, um, they maintain a lot of their uh, uh, normal uh, function um, uh, after surgery, the normal motion. Uh, for the surgeon, uh, it makes the access um, sometimes easier. Uh, sometimes the uh, surgical procedure takes less time, there's less blood loss. Um, all of those uh, really make it an attractive option uh, for treating patients. Uh, when we talk about minimally invasive surgery, uh, we talk about surgery uh, or a procedure that may involve needles. Um, sometimes the surgery is done through tubes. Um, that uh, allow for a good visualization. There's a, a use of um, a lot of uh, uh, endos endoscopic cameras uh, at times to help with, uh, with uh, visualization. Um, the use of, uh, of um, interoperative x-rays uh, help uh, with these procedures and uh, it's really a culmination of all these technologies uh, that make this type of surgery possible. So, so let, me, let me paraphrase this and, and I think one is what you're saying is that minimally invasive really means um, not just small incisions, but less tissue damage. That's so, so what you're really trying to do is is get in, do the job, don't damage any normal tissue that's then going to have to heal, but just go in and try to uh, get the job done without damaging that that's tissue. Right. That's right. Now, a couple of terms. One is endoscopic. You know, I think that there's been this trend in healthcare, especially surgery over the past 20 years. Um, we're now not doing surgery looking at the problem. We're doing surgery either looking at a computer screen or looking at a TV screen with a camera in our hands, or we're looking at x-ray TV where we're watching things go into the body on an x-ray screen and guiding that. You know, sort of like a, a glorified video game. That, that's that's you know that's correct. That's um, one of the one of the key aspects of uh, traditional surgery has been that uh, traditional open surgery has been that you need to visualize um, the pathology directly, visualize with your eyes, uh, you know what the uh, pathology is uh, as you're operating. Uh, one of the advances um, with minimally invasive surgery is that we use a lot of um, other techniques um, that uh, allow us to bypass directly looking at. Um, what we're operating on, and uh, what what I mean by that is, we use like you know video assistance. We use um, uh, small cameras that we can place through small holes um, that uh, give us a better approach towards uh, um, uh, what we're treating without disturbing tissues, without damaging tissues. Uh, we use uh, X-rays um, in the uh, OR uh, fluoroscopes, uh, which is a fancy word for a continuous X-ray um, that we use uh, in the operating room uh, to uh, guide us uh, in. Uh, uh, to help show us what position we may be in, uh, where we may be in the uh, spine while we're operating. We also use uh, uh, computer-aided navigation, um, which are uh, new techniques uh, that have uh, um, evolved to help uh, guide us uh, in, the, in the operating room. Now, in, in the lumbar spine, when we're talking about surgery on the low back, um, 
How has this impacted the way you approach surgery on the low back? What sort of procedures are you able to do now through a minimally invasive approach rather than actually visualizing the tissue itself? Um, pretty much any pathology in the lumbar spine can be treated uh, through a minimally invasive approach. That's not to say that every patient should be done in a minimally invasive way. Sometimes a minimally invasive approach is maximally ineffective. Um, so it really needs to be tailored towards um, a patient that's going to benefit from that. Um, a lot of patients will benefit from a minimally invasive approach should they decide to uh, have surgery done. Um, we are, with the present technology, are able to do discectomies, we can do fusions, uh, we can correct uh, degenerative scoliosis, um, all through a minimally invasive uh, approach, uh, which traditionally, you know, five years ago, we'd have to flay open uh, somebody's back, uh, do a lot of bony work, a lot of muscle dissection to accomplish the same thing. And I think uh, it's really an advance for us and an advance for uh, patient care. Now, what are the, what are the, the, the things that have made this possible? I, I, we've talked about the ability to visualize things, you know, to use different modalities like the computer-guided navigation, x-ray, and the small cameras. I'm assuming we're talking about a whole new um, uh, group of instruments and a whole new raft of, of devices that, that you can put in minimally evasive. That's correct. You know, it's, um, it's actually, it, you know, surgeons went back to the uh, drawing board and it was a whole new series of different approaches, even surgical approaches uh, to, to an area, you know, for, uh, for uh, the lumbar spine, you know, approaches that we used to do from the front and the back, we now do from the side. Um, as a way to uh, minimize uh, tissue damage. And in doing that, there had to be uh, a, the development of uh, new microsurgical tools, uh, new microsurgical uh, techniques, and uh, ways to uh, visualize and monitor the nerves and uh, you know, the uh, procedure as, as it's being done. Um, so it's really a brand new field um, uh, in and of itself uh, you know, that's uh, been a departure from what's uh, traditionally been, uh, been done. You know, it's, it's, it's relatively clear to me as, as, as a person who's uh, at least familiar with, with spine surgery to some degree, how you, you could m do a, a discectomy through a minimally invasive approach. I think it becomes more interesting when you're talking about doing a fusion, which when I trained was, as you said, a procedure that required you to open a, a huge incision on the back, open up and, and expose strip normal muscle away, damaging that muscle, from the vertebra that you were going to fuse, and then begin a process of straightening the spine or doing whatever you needed to do, and then completely taking the backside off of that spine and uh, making another incision, taking bone graft out of the pelvic bone, scooping it out and putting it in there and allowing this mass of bone and muscle and everything else to, to, to essentially healed together as one big chunk. And I think what you're telling me now is that that's no longer done. Right. There's, a, there's been the development of new technologies such as bone morphogenetic proteins, mm -hmm. um, which is a fancy name for a protein um, uh, that induces bone to grow. Um, with, the, uh, with the development of that technology, we're able to implant that into a little uh, plastic block uh, that's uh, either uh, that's made from a, a polymer that, uh, the, that's uh, biocompatible or uh, cadaveric bone, bone that we harvest uh, um, from, uh, from someone that's donated um, uh, their bone, uh, and place that in a minimally invasive uh, fashion uh, in between the vertebral bodies um, through a small incision that then uh, has a high likelihood of uh, actually fusing. Um, it's, uh, it's helped uh, us get around the, the necessity of getting an iliac uh, bone graft uh, or uh, performing these big procedures to get a lot of surface area to make sure that the bone, uh, bones fuse. Um, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very effective technology that's really changed the way we do things. Do, do you, as a neurosurgeon, and, and as a neurosurgeon, neurosurgical spine surgeon, do you actually ever harvest bone from a patient to put in another part of their body anymore or do you generally it's very, use BMP? very rare, very rare. Occasionally there will be patients that we need to do that but uh, the, um, the indications for it are very rare. In fact in the last year I think we've done only two harvests uh, out of the couple, you know, out of several hundred procedures that we've done. Um, BMP has really um, uh, sort of uh, given us the opportunity to stray away from that, um, which is uh, 
not only makes the surgery easier, but um, it's a, a really a significant benefit um, to, uh, to a patient because uh, traditionally what patients would complain about six months after the surgery is that my hip hurts mm. uh, from uh, the uh, donor site for harvesting the uh, bone. And um, I think uh, patients are very uh, appreciative of, uh, of, uh, of not having to deal with that mm. um, aspect. And I think it really improves the outcomes and, uh, and uh, overall uh, quality of the uh, care that we're able to give. Well, you know, it's interesting because I think patients probably don't understand what a major advance the BMP is because it, you can just assume that if you had a spinal fusion or a fusion of any bone in your body, if you had to harvest bone, you're really getting two operations. That's you're not correct. just getting one operation. That's you're getting an operation to do the procedure and a second operation to actually go in, um, make drill holes and take bone away, destroying more normal tissue. That was completely normal tissue that you're transplanting somewhere else in the body. So this is huge. Just getting rid of the bone graft it almost makes this minimally inv invasive, even if you just do the same. It makes procedure. it less invasive than yeah. what's traditionally done, absolutely. Right. right. And now, how do you as a surgeon make the decision of whether a procedure, such as a, a fusion, or you mentioned the uh, correction of a degenerative scoliosis, which in my mind is a, is a big task because it involves multiple levels, usually of the lumbar spine, that you have to address. How, can you, how do you as a neurosurgeon make a decision as to whether that procedure can be done minimally invasive? Yeah. It really um, uh, stems from understanding the anatomy and the pathology that a, a specific patient may have. Um, it's uh, understanding what uh, conditions can be treated uh, through a minimally invasive approach. Um, it's understanding the limitations of the technology. Um, uh, that said, there are a lot of patients that uh, would benefit um, from uh, a minimally invasive or MIS, what we call MIS um, approach to uh, treating these uh, uh, um, diseases. Uh, degenerative scoliosis, for one, is uh, something that uh, we now routinely treat through a minimally invasive approach. Traditionally, what we would have to do is make a big, long incision, put in screws through an open approach, derotate the spine uh, using rods, um, a fairly involved uh, procedure. We're now able to insert grafts in between the body to help straighten the spine out a little bit, place in screws, and through a minimally invasive method, uh, straighten the spine out. Um, that's been a huge advance uh, for us, and uh, you know the technology has really uh, made this uh, made this feasible. Well, it, I mean, it's just, it, it sounds like it's an exciting advance. What do you think's in the future? I mean, obviously, this is changing on almost a week by week basis in terms of you made the comment uh, you have to figure out what 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 is doable. It sounds like what's doable is changing on a week to week basis. Right. Right. You know, as the technology involves, uh, we're able to approach a lot more problems um, in a more effective manner through a minimally invasive uh, uh, approach. Um, as it stands right now, we're able to do quite a bit. Um, I think uh, the technology that's on the horizon um, was really geared towards uh, reducing the operative time, uh, making our accuracy uh, uh, better, and, um, and uh, also improving uh, the outcomes for the patients in terms of like shortening the time that they need to spend in the hospital um, and, uh, and shortening the time that it takes for them to uh, recover to their normal uh, baseline state. Well, are, are there any, any drawbacks to the minimally invasive? I, I mean, it's, it's clear to me that, uh, you know, the benefit of, of, of not damaging normal tissue is a huge advance. And that alone is worth the whole minimally invasive approach. Now, I would ask, what are the complications of this? I mean, because we're not being able to visualize, are certain structures more at risk? Do, is this something that we're going to see problems down the road with, 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 uh, I would say the success rate of a procedure goes down because we haven't done it adequately. What do you think and what do you see at this point as the, as the major risk of minimally invasive surgery? Um, so, so Randy, you know, the risks of, uh, of minimally invasive uh, surgery really um, are, it's dependent on making sure that you select the right patient for a minimally invasive procedure. I think um, in the hands of a uh, surgeon that has some expertise with uh, minimally invasive procedures, a lot of uh, what's commonly done can be done as effectively um, or better um, as an open, uh, as a, you know, as a traditional open procedure. Um, uh, that said, I think, you know, the critical factor is patient selection. Um, you need to make sure that uh, a specific patient's anatomy and problem um, can be effectively addressed with the uh, minimally invasive techniques that we have. 
Uh, not all conditions, I think, uh, are best treated through a minimally invasive approach. Uh, there's some conditions such as spinal stenosis, which is a uh, narrowing of the uh, spinal canal, which uh, uh, can be treated through a minimally invasive approach, but in my opinion may uh, be better treated through a traditional open approach. And I think these are all things that a patient needs to discuss with their uh, physician and uh, sort of weigh the pros and cons of uh, what a minimally invasive approach may entail versus an open uh, approach. Well, what do you see on the horizon today in terms of disease processes that you think are, are maybe not currently treated with a minimally invasive approach, but clearly there is, is new technique, there is new equipment, and there is new um, implants and, and, and the materials that we need to use to, to accomplish this on the horizon. Anything you can share with us? Yeah, I think um, there's going to be uh, advances up along two tracks. Um, one is your traditional rigid fusion or fixation procedure. I think uh, that technology is involving um, to give surgeons the ability to do that through a minimally invasive uh, uh, method in a very effective way. I think the other uh, tract is motion preservation technologies. Um, that coupled with minimally invasive surgery, which uh, preserves the normal tissue, may be a uh, powerful uh, treatment modality for certain patients. And uh, what I mean by motion preservation uh, technology is surgery that addresses uh, problems that a patient may have while still trying to maintain the normal motion and function of a patient's spine. Um, this is uh, coupled uh, pretty intricately with artificial discs, uh, possible facet joint replacements, uh, artificial facet joint replacements um, that uh, may open up a whole uh, um, aspect of, uh, of treatment options that we can offer patients that we traditionally haven't been able to. So I, let me paraphrase this and see if I understand because it's, it's, it's intriguing to me. You know, as an orthopedist, we, we've, we've, we're familiar with fusions. We fuse all sorts of joints. And, and even before the artificial hip, artificial knee, even when I trained 30 years ago, if you had a young person, you, didn't, you did not offer them an artificial joint. You basically went in and destroyed the normal anatomy and fused those, uh, for example, the knee. You would fuse it together, give that patient a stiff leg. It's, it's amazing to me that we're now thinking about the facet joints, little tiny joints in the, in the lumbar spine, the cervical spine, that I think as much as 10 years ago, we just sort of said, you know, when they're bad, we just take them out and we fuse those bones together and everything's happy. I think we found out that everything's not happy in the back when we do that. And trying to consider uh, something like a knee replacement in the, in the low back, replacing just that small joint that's smaller than a dime is, is amazing to me. Yeah, the technology is um, it's it's here. There's actually several uh, devices that uh, may be readily available uh, soon. Uh, the artificial discs um, have been uh, available for some time. I think the technology is now evolving to give us the ability to implant that through a uh, minimally invasive uh, uh, method. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, that's going to be uh, probably the next. Um, uh, jump for minimally invasive uh, surgery. Uh, the ability to replace those small joints um, in conjunction with, uh, with uh, artificial discs may uh, uh, give us the ability to treat patients that we traditionally couldn't offer a minimally invasive approach for and uh, would have to consider for, uh, would have to like, uh, strongly suggest a rigid uh, fusion uh, for them, uh, another option uh, that helps uh, maintain some of their mobility. Um, it's, uh, it's a very exciting field. I think there's going to be a lot of options available in the next year. Um, that uh, we didn't have uh, available to us that can really help us effectively address uh, some problems uh, in, in the lumbar spine. Now, if I'm a patient and I'm interested in trying to explore and do some research on my own about uh, minimally invasive surgery, and if I'm uh, looking at having to have some type of a spinal procedure in the lumbar spine, how do I go about identifying folks who may be trained and competent to offer me a minimally invasive procedure rather than the traditional approach? I mean, how, how, how easy it is, is it to find those people? Um, there, uh, you know, I think there are surgeons that will be readily accessible to patients. I think the important questions that patients should ask uh, when they do approach a, a surgeon is uh, what kind of training they've had. Um, are they, do they have subspecialty training in minimally invasive uh, spine surgery? Um, how many procedures have they done? Um, a lot of this uh, technology, because it is uh, evolving, um, really involves close uh, 
uh, surgeon um, interaction in terms of developing the technology, I would ask, uh, ask you know, the patient should ask their physician, are you involved in, uh, in any um, technological uh, uh, studies or any uh, innovative uh, device trials? Um, I think those are all indications of uh, a physician that may be um, uh, on the cutting edge of the technology or well, well versed uh, with, uh, with that technology. I think it's uh, important for patients to ask uh, what their complication rates are with this procedure, you know, what the efficacy rate is, you know, how, uh, how effective is this going to be for me uh, if we do undergo a minimally invasive procedure. Uh, I think uh, the other questions that are important are if I do undergo this minimally invasive procedure and I need some sort of revision surgery, will the traditional options still be available to me? I think those are uh, questions uh, that, uh, that, are, that a, any patient should ask uh, a physician, a surgeon that they're considering um, letting do a minimally invasive approach. Now, are there, there are minimally invasive procedures that burn bridges? From the exam, for, for example, uh, are there things that you can't go back and recover from and do what we would, as surgeons, would consider a salvage procedure, a procedure that is really designed to take care of a problem caused by a failure of the first operation? Anything out there that there really there are a few um, there are some fusion minimally invasive fusion procedures that may make it difficult for a surgeon to go back and put a graft in between uh, the vertebral bodies. Um, one uh, procedure being the uh, what's called the trans one approach. Um, it's a minimally invasive screw that's placed through the uh, sacrum into uh, the uh, lower part of the lumbar body. Uh, that may make a revision procedure a little difficult uh, because it makes it very difficult to place a uh, graft in between the two vertebral bodies. Um, that's not to say that a revision procedure um, is impossible, but like uh, it would definitely make it a little bit more challenging. Um, the, for the most part, uh, the other procedures such as a, uh, a, a spinal fusion procedure can be revised through a, uh, a traditional approach, but it may involve making another separate incision. Um, I think that uh, it really is important for a, a patient to understand what may be involved um, in a revision surgery should, uh, should uh, you know, the initial surgery not, not work adequately. Um, is minimally invasive surgery becoming the standard of care in neurosurgical spine surgery? Is this something that if I'm a patient I should expect to find in my local community or is this only being done in academic centers or uh, cutting-edge research facilities at this point. Yeah, I think um, I, I wouldn't go as far to say that it's standard of care at this point. I think at some point it will be. Um, and I think uh, as more surgeons are trained um, in minimally invasive uh, techniques, I think it'll become uh, more uh, prevalent. Um, a lot of it do is being done at a university setting, however, um, there are a lot of um, community physicians uh, that uh, um, will offer a minimally invasive, uh, uh, minimally invasive approach to treating some problems. Um, again, I think it's very important for a patient to ask uh, what kind of uh, training, be it fellowship training or a uh, or course or specific course that the uh, physician has gone to um, to see how uh, to assess how adequate he may to assess like how appropriate he may be to uh, do that. Uh, uh, particular procedure um, and I think it's very important for them to ask just some routine questions you know don't be afraid to ask how many of these have you done what's your complication rate uh, what's your success your success rate you know how do your patients do how long does it take for you know for me to get back on my feet what's the uh, what's the average operative time that I can expect is that shorter than the open procedure uh, those are very important questions for a patient to ask anything else we haven't covered in on this topic minimally invasive surgery of the lumbar spine Anything that you think patients really should know before they go searching the internet or looking at having a minimally invasive procedure? Anything we haven't covered? I think the most important thing is, um, you know, it's, it's good to go to the internet and get the you know, information, but it really is no substitute for talking to a specialist that does that. Um, oftentimes we'll see patients uh, that come in with a whole host of different devices um, saying, you know, I'd, I'd like this done and this or this minimally invasive procedure done. And uh, I think it, it really um, is much more complicated than that. It really, uh, deciding what procedure may be best for a patient really involves understanding their anatomy, uh, looking at their pictures, the MRI, CT scans, reviewing that with a uh, surgeon um, and getting a surgeon's perspective of, of how appropriate it actually would be to be treated uh, through a minimally invasive approach. So it's, uh, it's really um, uh, important for a patient to 
uh, have a, uh, a you know a good dialogue with uh, their surgeon to talk about all the various options um, that are available. Yeah, I think you made an interesting comment to that earlier, and that is minimally invasive surgery can be maximally, um, how did you put it, ineffective. So uh, I, I would say paraphrasing that, you're, you're seeing a surgeon to solve a problem, not necessarily to buy a product or a, a, a specific procedure. And you need to let that surgeon do what he does best and guide you in what's going to fix your problem, That's not correct. necessarily whether you want to have that procedure or not. That's correct. Well, excellent information. Thanks for, for sharing this with us. Um, I, I think folks will get a lot of use out of it. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for having me.